Hi, everyone, and welcome to theCUBE's ongoing coverage of SuperCloud 5, the battle for AI supremacy. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight. We are joined today by Ken Exner. He is the Chief Product Officer at Elastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Ken. Thank you, Rebecca. Great to be here. So today we're talking about Elastic's new launch of dedicated query language, what it means for Elastic's customers and what it means for the wider development community. Ken, why don't you start by talking a little bit about the impetus for, for, for this new language? What, what was the problem you were trying to solve? What was it that led to the development of it? Yeah, so um, we're happy to launch uh, ESQL, which is the new Elastic Search query language. Um, it is uh, a new search engine and a new search uh, uh, language. So it's a it's a piped query language that allows uh, developers and practitioners to to query various different data sets, pull data together, all in one query language, and be able to to construct fields on the fly, to be able to do uh, math and operations, to do joins on different data sets. It's a really powerful new query language uh, that sort of uh, makes it possible for people to do things in one query language that used to be only possible in different query languages. So if you are uh, an observability practitioner, for example, an SRE practitioner, you might have one query language for logs and another query language uh, for metrics and another query language for traces and APM. And you have always had a hard time of how do you pull data together from different data sets and do all of that in one query language? Well, we're, we're happy with ESQL that customers uh, can now do that. They have one query language that allows them to work across the different data sets and pull things together and do things that they couldn't do before. Uh, and because it's a new query engine uh, that's built directly in Elasticsearch, uh, it is it is native in the, the engine and it is super fast. Uh, customers have always loved the speed of Elasticsearch uh, for search. And now with this new query API and new query engine, we have blazing fast uh, performance for queries as well. Okay. So, but it is 2023 and, and really the buzz is around generative AI. So how does this new language relate to AI? Does it relate to AI? It does. So I, I, I hear this question a lot. Um, thing about AI, generative AI, is it's only as good as the foundation it's built on. So when you're, when you're using code generation, for example, uh, you, you need to build on top of APIs, on top of libraries, on top of frameworks. Like if you're using a, a code generation uh, tool and you're, say you're trying to build like a thumbnail service on top of like an object storage system, like something that creates thumbnail images, it's not going to build the computer first. <laughs> it's not going to build S3 first. It's going to start some, from some foundational primitives and then build up from that. So if you're, you're building this thumbnail service, it's going to build on top of S3 libraries that build on top of S3. The same thing for... Uh, the, the use cases we're trying to solve for here. So if, if a customer wants to uh, do some analytics on different data sets, they want to build it on top of some foundational primitives, and that's what ESQL gives them. Is it gives them a really robust foundational language for how to pull data from different data sets, uh, whether it's structured or unstructured data, and be able to do you know, different types of aggregations, you know, set alerts uh, based on uh, whatever, uh, you know, whatever kind of... Uh, 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 studying you want to come up with in your language, uh, create detection rules that run on the uh, uh, in real time. All these things can happen on top of uh, the data that, that you're bringing in. And if you want to, on top of that, build a natural language interface, uh, do some other things like that, we can do that too. In fact, we actually have done that with our uh, AI assistant uh, in Elastic. The AI assistant uh, allows you to use natural language to map into uh, the Elastic query, uh, query language. So you can uh, just you know, think of how you want to construct a query. So I want to uh, you know, pull data from this data source and I want to look at all the hosts that have CPU above uh, 40% that um, have had uh, you know, a particular type of latency, like you know, greater than a two second latency and uh, where there have been errors you know, more than 50% uh, over the last hour. Like constructing a query like that across different data sets and doing it in natural language is possible now because of the foundational capabilities that we have with ESQL. So it really sounds as though it is addressing a lot of the complexity uh, and the fragmentation in the data landscape. Are there any other unique capabilities or features that, that differentiate it from other languages? Yeah, so uh, you're absolutely right. One of the things that it's doing is it's giving you one uh, language 
uh, that works across structured and unstructured data sets uh, and does this in a very natural piped language uh, format. So if you, if you think about uh, query languages that are out there, um, they, they typically are for structured data sets like uh, SQL uh, or for their un unstructured data sets like, um, like logs, for example. And you had different types of uh, languages that you used based on whether it was structured or unstructured. You use SQL, and people love certain things about SQL. It's very readable. It allows you uh, to do joins on data sets. It allows you to do various SQL statements. But if you go to the unstructured world, it's totally different. So what we've done with ESQL is sort of brought the best of structured and unstructured into this new piped query language that allows you to iteratively build up queries uh, and, and pull the, some of the best capabilities, do lookups and joins and unions, uh, be able to construct fields on the fly, uh, be able to do math operations on data, all this on unstructured data too. Uh, so that's, that's a super powerful sort of new capability that uh, data practitioners have not had, uh, uh, you know, observability and security practitioners have not had the ability to do that before. So your, your recent announcement says that this is available in technical preview. What does that mean, and, and how can companies and organizations use this language? Uh, yeah, so it's in tech preview. All that means is that it's freely available to everyone to begin using, um, but because it's in preview, we're still you know refining the APIs, and we're still we there are still some known limitations. Um, we want to be able to you know take customer feedback and then lock down the APIs, and that's where we give GA. GA is when we when sort of make a commitment that no API changes are gonna uh, exist after that uh, for that version. So people are free to use it now. In fact, people even before this release have been using it in private preview. We have a, a large number of customers who have been giving us feedback in private preview for the last half year or so. Uh, so customers can begin using it now, uh, whether um, they're, you know, uh, you know, as part of the private preview or now in the open public. People can start giving us feedback. And then once it's GA, we'll, we'll, we'll lock in the APIs and uh, move forward from there. Okay. So what are you hearing from, from that feedback that you said you've had it for about six months now? What are the kinds of things you're hearing from customers in terms of how they're using it and what are they seeing? Yeah. So one of the biggest use cases that we see is uh, security analysts, security analysts that want to do threat hunting uh, in logs and other types of uh, unstructured data sources. And what they typically are doing is pulling data from over here and over here, and they're they're wanting to run sort of uh, uh, queries on, on top of uh, multiple data sets. Uh, and the typical workflow that they go through is an iterative workflow. If you think about a threat hunter, they're thinking, I'm looking for, I want to see all the login attempts uh, for the last hour um, that originated in a particular IP range, like maybe from a particular, you know, from Vietnam. Uh, and I want to see um, uh, login attempts from uh, accounts that were created in the last day and had, pre you know, they, come, they iteratively construct these queries. Uh, and what has happened before is they had to do this across numer numerous different tools and numerous different data sets. So what, what Elastic, um, uh, what the ESQL release allows them to do is do that in one language, just build up this iterative query um, uh, uh, that sort of matches how they think about threat hunting. Uh, and do this in one language, one powerful new language. So we're hearing a lot of feedback about how that is greatly improving uh, the threat hunting experience for security analysts who want to be able to have a tool like this that allows them to pull data from different data sources and iteratively build up their queries. It matches how they think and how they do their job. So we're hearing a lot of positive feedback from that. that community. So it sounds as though it is pretty seamless integration into existing workflows. Um, that are, that for organizations, particularly who are relying on various sources of data. Yeah, if if you um, if you have logs and metrics, if you have uh, network logs and application logs, and they exist in different indices, you're able to pull these things together and and figure out how to manipulate that that data in one uh, one query language. So, you know, whether you are trying to build up a dashboard, this is a query language that can help you build up that dashboard across different data sets. Or if you're trying to set an alert uh, so that you can alarm on a particular case, or you, you're trying to create a detection rule for looking for particular vulnerabilities, you can construct these things all in one language, whether it's uh, logs or metrics or any other type of data set, whether it's structured or unstructured. Uh, so it's it's quite powerful that that uh, these practitioners now have one tool, one language that works across different types of data, 
uh, and uh, allows them to you know construct these these complex queries fast. So what are your metrics for success and how are you going to determine whether this is having the impact you want it to? You use the great example of the threat hunters and they're they're able to do what they want to do faster, uh, more efficiently, more effectively. But what are some of the other things you're going to be looking at to determine whether or not this is having the impact? Um, I expect it to uh, replace the existing uh, uh, DSLs and existing query languages that have existed in the uh, Elastic uh, community. A lot of them have been sort of bolted on uh, on top of the uh, the search API. This is a new, you know, built from the ground up uh, cert, um, query language that uh, has a new query API. I expect it to replace uh, a lot of the uh, existing use cases. So I'm I'm looking to see if people adopt it. Uh, people uh, start constructing their alerts and detection rules based on this. So success for me is if I start seeing customers using it and getting a lot of value out of it. Success for me is also customers asking for more features and more capabilities because then then we know that uh, we have something that resonates that uh, customers are starting to get invested in. So, uh, so far, uh, so good. We're hearing a, a lot of positive feedback, a lot of requests for new capabilities. People are, are now kind of, uh, you know, their imaginations have, kind of uh, been let uh, wild and starting to think about what can we do now that we have the ability to pull different data sets and, 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 and do this all in one query language. They start uh, imagining new possibilities. And I love that because then we get, you know, brilliant new ideas from our customers about how to, how to make it even better. Well, I really love what you're saying there because that really is about bringing this kind of curious, open mindset to, to innovation and how companies are then able to think even more expansively and ambitiously about new products, innovations, and services. How is the introduction of this, or how do you foresee it influencing the larger development community? I mean, you you said you expect to see other languages maybe laid to rest um, because because of this new one. How what what a kind of impact do you expect to have it on the larger community? Um, you know, any good product experience, uh, it's a it's a collaboration with your customers. And your uh, someone uh, asked me like. Are we done with our product? And I'm like, no, you're not done with your product. If you if customers are asking for things, you're, you're constantly iterating. So development of, of good products is a is a joint effort between customers and and the and the company producing that. So I always think that um, we need to you know have a partnership with our customers, be listening to what they're asking for, uh, trying to you know get feedback uh, constantly. And with ESQL, like that's one of the reasons we had a private beta for the last half years. We were wanting to you know, get feedback and iterate on that. This is why we're doing the technical preview right now. We're wanting to iterate and get feedback before we lock down the APIs. Again, it is an iterative experience with our customers to develop a great product. Um, so I, I always want to hear customer feedback. I want customers to tell us where to go. Um, and uh, I think ESQL is sort of the product of that collaboration with our customers where they were telling us about their workflow and how they work and how they want to work. And we were trying to build a query engine and a query language from the ground up that matched that workflow, that matched what they were trying to do, you know, um, you know, and and, and uh, address some of the limitations that they had run into. So if you're an SRE practitioner and you said, I love, you know, being able to use Elasticsearch and, and you know, build dashboards and set alerts, but here's my problem. Uh, I, I need to work across different tools when I'm looking at metrics versus logs. So we thought, how do we fix that? So the same thing going forward, we're going to continue working with our customers and building um, more capabilities into Elasticsearch and into ESQL based on their feedback and based on their usage. Uh, I'm excited for the collaboration we have with our customers. Well, describing the hand-in-glove collaboration you had and how it really was a constant feedback loop, did you face any skepticism early on with maybe some who said, do we really need another language? Sure. Uh, we face that skepticism internally too. <laughs> so, uh, we, you know, uh, over the years, we had built support for multiple uh, 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 different uh, DSLs and query languages on on top of uh, on top of Elasticsearch, but they were always kind of bolted on. So we, you know, uh, we have the original Search API, and then we we built mappings uh, to a query DSL, which is a JSON representation that feeds into the uh, Search API, and then we started supporting. Uh, to a limited extent, various other query languages like EQL and SQL and KQL and Canvas and Painless, a bunch of different, I think there's like nine or 10 different um, uh, query languages that are at least partially supported, but they were always bolted on. They were, they mapped 
uh, uh, to query DSL, which mapped to the search API. So if we're adding another one of those, yeah, we don't need that. <laughs> we don't need to do that. Um, but that's not what we're doing here. What we're doing here is creating a new query API that is that is built into the query Elasticsearch engine uh, that has a new uh, language that is designed from the ground up around how our customers work. And once once we realize that that's what we were trying to accomplish, once customers realize that that's what we were trying to accomplish, they were all in. They were excited because it wasn't just another thing that was going to follow the same pattern as before. This was built from the ground up around their workflow, around how they wanted to work, around what they were trying to do. Are there any specific industries or sectors where you see ESQL making a, a significant impact upon its release? I think two sectors in particular. I, I think uh, security practitioners uh, who, who use Elastic and Elasticsearch uh, as a security analytics platform, I think they're going to greatly benefit from this because it helps them with their threat hunting. Um, I think also observability practitioners, so SREs and DevOps practitioners um, who are you know looking for root cause for particular issues, who are creating dashboards, who are setting alerts. Um, they're going to be able to do all that work in one new query language rather than having to work across different tools and different query languages. They're going to be able to have one uh, query language, one powerful query language that works across metrics, log, traces, APM data, and, and more. Uh, so I think those two sets of customers um, are going to benefit the most. And I think there's going to be creative uses even beyond that. Um, you know, once people you know realize that you can uh, manipulate data set, different data sets, they're going to start coming up with business analytics use cases. They're going to come up with uh, uh, search use cases, AI use cases, you know, beyond what we we see. But I know, I know that observability and security practitioners are going to love this. And you are an industry veteran. You were at AWS for a very long time. You're now at CPO of Elastic. What are some specific AI-related innovations and trends that you foresee having a significant impact on cloud services? Um, not only in 2024, I mean, we're, we're rounding out 2023 now, but but even in the years to come. Um, so many. <laughs> like I, I, I am, do you have all day? Yeah, I, yeah. Do, how, about, how much time do we have? I, um, I'm, uh, I'm very bullish on this. Um, I'll talk about some of the things that uh, we're doing inside uh, Elastic. I think it's sort of an example of, of how we're embracing uh, AI and generative AI and where we see it going. Uh, but I'll also talk a little bit more broader. Um, Within uh, the observability and security space, there's a, a few things that are, you know, we've seen over the years that are transforming these uh, three areas. Uh, one is uh, around uh, auto detection. Like what, the whole promise of AI ops was to help cu uh, customers with detection of, of issues. So we introduced anomaly detection, you know, both at, you know, at Elastic, but also in the industry. People were starting to use uh, um, automatic detection as a way to sort of uh, make people more productive and find issues before. Um, before they, they stumbled into them. Um, we're now also getting into the area of, of uh, getting to a diagnosis. Uh, how do you find root cause faster? Uh, if you're, if you're uh, an, an operator, an SRE professional, you spend a lot of time, once you detect an issue, trying to figure out root cause. Same thing with security. You're trying to you know, figure out how, how do I get to the, you know, once I have a security issue, how do, I, how do I figure out where it's coming from and who it is? You're trying to di do diagnosis. And then you're trying to get to remediation. I think across detection, diagnosis, and remediation, remediating an operational issue or remediating a security incident, generative AI is going to have a huge impact. Uh, we're investing uh, at Elastic in, in, in making detection auto detection. We're making uh, diagnosis auto diagnosis, making remediation uh, auto remediation. I think generative AI is having a huge impact there. Um, we're also uh, at Elastic uh, focused on helping customers, um, you know, leverage the power of LLMs and generative AI on their private data. Uh, so earlier this year, we launched Esray, which is a new relevance engine that helps customers create a bridge between their private data and public LLMs. You know, lots of customers are wanting to figure out how to take advantage of the, of the power of, of generative AI and LLMs, but they have lots of private data uh, that they don't want to. They want to keep private. Um, so how do they how do they work with uh, uh, large language models? Well, one option is you can hire a bunch of applied scientists and, and build uh, your own uh, LLMs or do your own training, but that's hugely expensive. So what we've done at Elastic is we've helped customers create that bridge to these large language models. 
keeping their data private, but figuring out how to pass the right context to an LLM so that they can build generative AI applications. And we're seeing tons of, of interest and adoption uh, in these capabilities where customers are take, able to take their private data and start building generative AI applications using Esre and, and the tools of Elastic. Wow, exciting times. Thank you so much, Ken Exner, for coming on theCUBE. Thank you, Rebecca. And stay tuned for more of theCUBE's coverage of SuperCloud 5. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise technology coverage.